as the fastest growing major cloud service provider, Google Cloud Platform is making a significant impact on the cloud adoption choices by several retail users and enterprises these days. More and more new users are getting attracted by the convenience and features offered by the platform. With the rapid adoption rates and concerns related to the susceptibility of security and related things can also take place here. Accordingly, users have to keep an eye on the top GCP best practices that can benefit them to effortlessly meet their business objectives with fewer security concerns. If you are a GCP user or want to adopt this platform for your business, make sure to follow the best practices of Google Cloud Platform. Hello everyone, this is Truf from Edureka and I welcome you all to this session where I will be talking about GCP best practices. So without any further ado, let's take a look at today's agenda. We will start this session by first understanding the best practices of data management in Google Cloud Platform and then we will understand the best practices for optimizing costs as well as for increasing the efficiency of networking and security. After that, we will get an overview of the best practices for selecting region in Compute Engine as well as for training AI and ML models on the AI platform. Before we begin, do consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on trending technologies. And also, if you are interested in online training certification in Google Cloud Platform, check out the link given in the description box below. So first, let's understand the best practices under data management. So first, you have to ensure a total visibility of data. Without a holistic view of data and its resources, it can be difficult to know what data you have, where data originated from, and what data is in the public domain that shouldn't be. Second, to design data loss prevention policies in Juicehoot. So data loss prevention in Juicehoot is a, a set of policies, processes, and tools that are put in place to ensure your sensitive information won't be lost during a fire, a natural disaster, or break-in. You never know when tragedy will strike. That's why you should invest in prevention policies before it's too late. Third is have a logging policy in place. So it is important to create a comprehensive logging policy within your cloud platform to help with auditing and compliance. Access logging should be enabled on storage buckets so that you have an easily accessible log object access. Administrator audit logs are created by default, but you should enable data access logs for data rights in all services. Also use display names in data flow pipelines. So always use a name field to assign a useful at a glance name to the transform. This field value is reflected in the Cloud Dataflow monitoring UI and can be incredibly useful to anyone looking at the pipeline. It is often possible to identify performance issues without having to look at the code using only the monitoring UI and well-named transforms. Then moving on to the second category that is cost optimization. So one of the best practices for cost optimization is to automate it, like automating the tasks and reduce manual intervention. Automation is simplified using a label, which is a key value pair applied to various Google Cloud services. You can attach a label to each resource, such as compute instances, then filter the resources based on their labels. So the second best performance under cost optimization is using preemptable virtual machines. As with most trade-offs, the biggest reason to use a preemptable virtual machine is cost. So preemptive virtual machines can save up to 80% compared to a normal on-demand virtual machine. This is a huge savings if the workload you are trying to run consists of short-lived processes or things that are not urgent and can be done anytime. So the third one is uh, purchase commitments. The sustained usage discounts are a major differentiator for GCP. They apply automatically once your instance is online for more than 25% of the monthly billing cycle and can net you a discount of up to 30% depending on instance type. You can combine sustained and committed use discounts, but not at the same time. Committed use can get you a discount of up to 57% for most instance types and up to 70% for memory optimized types. Fourth is utilize cost management tools that take action. Using third party tools for cloud optimization help with cost visibility and governance and cost optimization. Make sure you aren't just focusing on cost visibility and recommendations, but find a tool that takes the extra step and takes those actions for you. This automation reduces the potential for human error and saves organization time and money by allowing developers to reallocate their time to more beneficial tasks. Now the last best performance in the cost optimization is optimized performance and storage costs. In the cloud where storage is built as a separate line item, paying attention to storage utilization and configuration can result in substantial cost savings and storage needs like compute are always changing. It's possible that the storage class you picked when you first set up your environment may no longer be appropriate for a given workload. Moving on to the next category that is networking. 
So the first best performance in the networking is use virtual private cloud to define your network. So use uh, VPCs and subnets to map out map out your network and to group and isolate related sources. Virtual private cloud is a virtual session of a physical network. Virtual private cloud networks provide scalable and flexible networking for compute engine virtual machine instances and for the services that leverage virtual machine instances including Google Kubernetes engine data proc and data flow among others. VPC networks are global resources. A single VPC can span multiple regions without communicating over the public internet. This means you can connect and manage resources distributed across the globe from a single Google Cloud project and you can create multiple isolated VPC networks in a single project. VPC networks themselves do not define IP addresses ranges. Instead, each VPC network consists of one or more partitions called subnetworks. Each subnet in turn defines one or more IP address ranges. Subnets are regional resources. Each subnet is explicitly associated with a single region. Then we have centralized, like you have to centralize the network control. So use shared VPC to connect to a common VPC network. Resources in those projects can communicate with each other securely and efficiently across project boundaries using internal IPs. You can manage shared network resources such as subnets, routes, and firewalls from central host project, enabling you to apply and post consistent network policies across the projects. With shared VPC and IAM controls, you can separate network administration from uh, project administration. This separation helps you implement the principle of least privilege. For example, a centralized network team can administer the network without having any permissions into the participating projects. Similarly, the project admins can manage their project resources without any permissions to manipulate the shared network. Then connect your enterprise network. So many enterprises need to connect existing on-premises infrastructure with their Google Cloud resources. Evaluate your bandwidth, latency, and SLA requirements. Choose the best connection option. If you need low latency, highly available enterprise-grade connections that enable you to reliably transfer data between your on-premises and VPC networks without traversing the internet connections to Google Cloud, then use Cloud Interconnect. And if you don't require the low latency and high availability of Cloud Interconnect, or you are just starting on your uh, cloud journey then use cloud vpn now moving on to the next category of best practices that is uh, security so under this first one is like apply least privilege access controls or identity and access management the principle of least privilege is a critical foundation element in gcp security the principle is the concept of only providing employees with access to applications and resources they need to properly do their jobs second is the uh, manage unrestricted traffic and firewalls Limit the IP ranges that you assign to each firewall to only the networks that need access to those resources. GCP's advanced VPC features allow you to get any granular with traffic by assigning targets by tag and service accounts. This allows you to express traffic flows logically in a way that you can identify later, such as allowing a front-end service to communicate to virtual machines in the back and service, service account. And the third one is ensure your bucket names are unique across the whole platform. It is recommended to append random characters to the bucket name and not include the company name in it. This will make it harder for an attacker to locate buckets in a targeted attack. Fourth is set up a Google Cloud organizational structure. When you first log into your Google Admin Console, everything will be grouped into a single organizational unit. Any settings you apply to this group will apply to all the users and devices in the organizations. So planning out how you want to organize your units and hierarchy before diving in will help you save time and create a more structured security strategy. Moving on to the next category, compute engine region selection. So the first one in this is when to choose your compute engine region. So early in the architecture phase of an app, decide how many and which compute engine regions to use. Your choice might affect your app. For example, architecture of your app might change if you synchronize some data between copies because the same users could connect through different regions at the same time. Also like price differs by region. And also process to move an app and its data between regions is cumbersome and sometimes costly. So should be avoided once the app is live. Second is we need to see the factors to uh, consider while selecting regions. Okay, there are multiple factors where you decide to deploy your app. Okay, so first factor is latency. However, this is a complex problem because the user latency is affected by multiple aspects such as caching and load balancing mechanisms. In enterprise use cases, latency to on-premises systems or latency for a certain subset of users or partners is more critical and the second factor affecting is price so google cloud resources if you see like their costs differ by region the resources available to estimate the prices are compute engine pricing pricing calculator google cloud skus billing api if you decide to deploy multiple regions 
be aware that there are network charges for data synced between regions. And the third factor affecting is co-location with other Google Cloud services. So co-locate your compute engine resources with other uh, Google Cloud services uh, wherever possible. While most latency sensitive services are available in every region, some services are available only in specific locations. Fourth factor affecting is uh, machine type availability. Not all CPU platforms and machine types are available in every region. The availability of specific CPU platforms or specific instance type differ by region and even zone. The fifth factor affecting is resource quotas. Your ability to deploy compute engine resources is limited to regional resources quotas. So make sure that you request sufficient quota for the regions you plan to deploy in. Moving on to the third best practice that is evaluating latency requirements. So latency is often the key consideration for your region selection because high user latency can lead to an inferior user experience. You can affect some aspects of latency, but some are outside of your control. Region selection can only affect the latency to the compute engine region and not like entirety of the latency. So the first one in this is a last mile latency. The latency of the segment differs depending on the technology used to access the internet. Then the second one is the Google front end and the edge pop latency. These are like subcategories under evaluate latency requirements or best practices. So second subcategory I mean is Google front end and edge pop latency. Depending on your deployment model, the latency to Google's network edge is also important. This is where Google load balancing products terminate TCP and SSL sessions and from which cloud CDN delivers cache results. Based on the content sir, many round trip might already end here because only part of the data needs to be retrieved the whole way. Okay, so moving on to the third subcategory that is compute engine region latency. So in compute engine region latency, the user request enters Google's network at the edge pop. The compute engine region is where Google Cloud Services handling requests are located. This segment is the latency between the edge pop and compute engine region, and it's so wholly within Google's global network. So the fourth subcategory is app latency. Different apps have uh, different latency requirements. Depending on the app, users are more forgiving of latency issues. Apps that interact asynchronously or mobile apps with a high latency threshold, 100 milliseconds or more, can be deployed in a single region without degrading the user experience. However, for apps such as uh, real time games or a few milliseconds of latency can have a greater effect on user experience. Deploy these uh, types of apps in multiple regions close to the users. Now moving on to the next category that is AR platform training. We have different uh, best practices and under AR platform training also. So the first one is choose the right machine configuration for your training characteristics. You can choose arbitrary machine types and various GPU types. The machine configuration that you choose depends on your data size, model size, and algorithm selection. For example, deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch benefit from GPU acceleration, while frameworks like Scikit-Learn and XGBoost don't. On the other hand, when you are training a larger Scikit-Learn model, you need a memory optimized machine. Okay, so the second one in this is don't use large machine for simple models. Simple models might not train faster with the GPUs or with distributed training because they might not be able to benefit from increased hardware parallelism. Because the scikit-learn framework doesn't support distributed training, make sure that you use only the scale tire or custom machine type configurations that correspond to a single worker instance. And the third best performance is scale up before scaling out. So scaling up instead of scaling out while experimenting can help you identifying the configurations that are performant and cost effective. For example, start by using a single worker that uh, has a single GPU and then try a more powerful GPU before you use multiple GPUs. After that, try distributed training as discussed later in the section. Scaling up is faster than scaling out because uh, network latency is much lower than the GPU interconnect. And the fourth best performance under AR platform training is uh, for large data sets, use distributed training. So distributed training platforms data parallelism on a cluster of nodes to reduce the time required to train a TensorFlow model when you use a large data set. Make sure that you adjust the number of iterations with respect to the distribution scales. That is, take the total number of iterations that are required and divide the total by number of GPUs multiplied by the number of work nodes. I hope you have understand all the best practices under the Google Cloud Platform. So with this, we come to an end of today's session of Google Cloud Platform Best Practices. I hope you had a great time learning and understanding about it. And if you have any queries, please feel free to leave them down in the comment section below. Until next time, thank you. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist. 
and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!